insignificant. I'm, I'm telling you right now, it means absolutely nothing to the world. They think it's foolish. Let me tell you something. When nine-year-old Clay Payne got saved at that camp in June, the world never saw any of it. My son Philip and, and little Kevin Chisholm, they sat there on the bed and helped me read that boy the verses. They saw it. But most of all, we know that that boy was transferred. He was put from being alienated. He was taken from being a completely helpless, lost sinner who did not know how to get to heaven to being put into the body of Christ. Now that is powerful. And 150 million years into eternity, I'm going to get a fellowship with little Clay. Not because of what I did, but because of God's Word and its availability to me and to those children, that boy could hear the words, just like I heard him when I was six. Paul says, to have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, nothing will bring peace to a person like the gospel of grace. It's great, isn't it? We're wealthy in Christ, aren't we? We have it all. So when you get down about your bills and all the things that you want, you can't have, you think about the money you owe, the hole you've dug, and all the other things. You think about all you have in Christ. And it'll let, you, it'll let you very quickly let go of all those things. One of the great philanthropists, I think it was uh, one of the Rockefellers, the old one, the old man, old man Rockefeller, John D., I think, he said that he would give his entire fortune for the love of a good woman. When, you know, when you're worth millions and millions of dollars, you just never know when somebody loves you, whether they love your money or you. Your friends, everything is always suspect. You have to guard it. Try to keep it. Wouldn't that be a burden? I mean, I know what people say. I, I have a friend of mine, he says, I li I've been rich, I've been poor, I like rich better. Well, all right, everybody likes to have, everybody likes to abound. No doubt. But let me tell you something. When you begin to learn this right here, this will get you through a prison cell right here. This will get you through a funeral, the loss of your husband and wife, your child. This will get you through life. The money comes, it goes. This will get you through because it's eternal. Okay, let's have a word of prayer and we'll close. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your goodness and we thank you for the patience of these folks here tonight. As we study the Word of God together, we thank you for the opportunity to come here and to fellowship with them and to, to spend the time getting to know them. We thank you, Lord, for this. We thank you for the great ministry that's going on here. We thank you for the, the opportunity that this church has in this area to be a beacon and to hold forth the word of life to the people in this area that they may get saved and established in the faith. We pray for them and we pray for their work and uh, most of all, Lord, we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. My son, Stephen, when he first uh, started learning about church, our, our local assembly down there in St. Petersburg was formed because we needed a Bible-believing church for our children. And Stephen, we'd ask him, what, the name, what is the name of your church? And he would say, Coast Sun Bibleship. And uh, he was just a little guy. He's 15 now. We started that church when uh, he was just a few years old. And uh, we did it for the express purpose of having a place for our children to fellowship. And uh, I have a wife and three children at home. Stephen's 15. Amanda is uh, 11. And Philip's 9. And uh, we have a good time at our house. We, we uh, enjoy the fellowship with the saints. And it's good to be here with you. I appreciate the fellowship uh, with all of you in that uh, most of you don't realize the impact that this ministry has had on me. Uh, when, when Dictionary of the Gospel came out, that book that you have out there, uh, it really, it turned my life around in my understanding of the gospel of the grace of God. I knew the gospel of grace. I was saved when I was six years old. And uh, it was uh, a time in which my father led me to the Lord Jesus Christ on a Monday morning. Uh, I had uh, gone to a funeral 
And uh, I saw my great-grandmother in a casket, which was a, a, a very interesting thing for me to see at that age. And I would encourage all of you to take your children to funerals too and let them see a corpse. Let them go there because I spent several months being hell scared. And I woke up one Monday morning and I was scared of going to hell. And I was so scared of it that I had to tell my parents about it because I wasn't getting any sleep. And as a result, uh, my mom said, well, I think you need to stay home and talk to your dad. So I stayed home. My dad was off on Mondays. And I crawled up in the bed with him. He took one of these off his nightstand and led me to Christ. And the first time I ever heard the gospel of the grace of God, I got saved right then. And uh, I, I want to tell you, I was telling Pastor Tom today, I saw a little nine-year-old boy get saved at camp this year. Uh, my nine-year-old and another nine-year-old had the pleasure of doing that with me and helping me lead him to Christ. Did it on the bottom bunk. And uh, I got to stay in a cabin full of nine-year-olds and eight-year-olds and seven-year-olds, and they were a lot of fun. I had to tell one young boy that I was going to take his flashlight away from him if he didn't turn it out. <laughs> And he said, you know, you can get arrested for that. I said, I don't care, Donovan, I don't care. I'm going to take that flashlight away and you're not going to have it the rest of the week. He said, well, he says, I'm going to call your grandma on you then. So they have little things that they respond back and forth. But you know, those kids, they come to Bible camp to get saved. That's what we, we, we bring them there to have influence on them. But those who are lost can get saved and and. Clay Payne is saved right now because some people had some foresight to have a camp for him to go to. And uh, I want to uh, encourage you to keep your children in those kind of activities. Uh, we saw two other young boys get saved in the church this summer, and it's an exciting thing. Uh, when you have a, an eight-year-old boy, a little boy looked at me, and I, we were dealing with him in the Sunday school, and the whole Sunday school class was dealing with him together. We were all working with him, and uh, I asked him, uh, I said, if you died today and you stood before the Lord Jesus Christ and he asked you, why should I let you into heaven with me to spend eternity with me, what would you tell him? And he didn't have an answer. I said, uh, well, if you could know, would you like to know? And Ryan looked up at me with his big eyes and he said, now what do you do with that? You have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace so you can give him the gospel of the grace of God and get him saved right there. His father was elated and his brother got saved the next week. So we're excited about children getting saved because they need to get saved at an early age. I've only been up here a few hours. I'm already missing my own children. But uh, I'm glad to be here with you tonight. And I want to tell you that this church here in Warren, Michigan is, is many times in our prayers. It's had a great influence on me. Uh, your pastor has had a great influence on me, and he's going to say, when did I do that? But it's the preaching that he does on the videos and on the tapes and the books that he's written and the conference speaking and the reputation and good report that this church has has been an encouragement to us. And I know you don't always see that because you're coming here every week, and it doesn't look that way to you. Maybe not, at least from the inside. But I'm going to tell you that uh, the folks in St. Petersburg, are, uh, we're encouraged to be uh, influenced by such a group as you. And we appreciate you folks. And uh, I want to hopefully, if I can, uh, deliver the goods tonight. So if you want Ephesians chapter 1, and before we begin, let's have a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for this time together. We thank you for this conference. We thank you for these folks here tonight who have taken the time out of their schedules to come and support and to be faithful in the studying of your word. We thank you, Lord, for the word of truth that we have, that we can have it in our hand, that we don't have to worry about uh, finding it, that we have it, that we must just study it to show ourselves approved unto you. We thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who paid the ultimate price that we may have eternal life by grace through faith. We thank you for it all tonight. In his name we pray. Amen. If you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, I, I hope that you don't leave here without making that decision. The decision to trust Christ is the single most important decision a person ever makes in their life. The second most important decision they ever make is the mate that they choose for life. And uh, that's a very important thing, and these are things we have to instill in our children. The, uh, the time for you to believe the gospel, if you're not saved, is right now, tonight. You don't need to leave this room 
without uh, believing that the Lord Jesus Christ died for your sins. I brought one of our little uh, placards down there. It's a little license plate. I put that up. I told Pastor Boucher that in case I mess this up, you guys can get the message. There it is. That's the issue. I, had, I took 14 children to, uh, to Bush Gardens down there to ride the rides, and we all had the shirts on. And we have that, we have that on shirts front and back. And uh, just watching the crowd as they begin to look at us as we walk by, they're reading. And the people that would walk up and say, hey, we like your shirt. And then we would say, yeah, what do you like about it? Do you believe it? And there's an opportunity, see? So you have to, if you're going to wear something on your shirt, I know Jesus loves me, he's nice. And I know that all the Christian shirts out there that are, you know, there, there's a lot of them and, and there's some good ones, but... If you're going to spend the time to, to wear something, uh, wear something that will get somebody saved when they believe it. Okay? Uh, Mr. O'Hare went to great lengths to put that on top of the North Shore Church. And uh, as a result, uh, you could see that sign all the way out into Lake Michigan, I guess, probably 15, 20 miles. Especially during the fog. Uh, Pastor Lenny Anderson used to go up there on top of the North Shore Church and change the light bulbs. They were about this big. And he used to change the light bulbs in that sign. There was about a thousand of them in there. And him and his uh, uh, fiance would go up there. That's how they met. And that's how they got to know each other was to go up there changing the light bulbs. That's a real ministry, isn't it? So, you know, Christ died for our sins is not a new message. Uh, it is the message. And it's the only message that will save a sinner today. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to have to do a broad brush approach tonight. Because the book of Ephesians is the pinnacle of all truth in the Word of God. It is the apex of everything God wants to say to you as members of the body of Christ. And it's going to be difficult in, in the period of time we have, just in these few nights that we have, to even come close to scratching the surface. So I, I, I hope that you'll be patient with me. We're going to breeze through this fairly quickly. And if, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to help you with, with that afterwards too. I want to talk to you about our wealth in the Lord Jesus Christ. The wealth that you have. Did you know that Bill Gates... Have you ever heard of Bill Gates? Everybody knows who Bill Gates is. Bill Gates is worth $90 billion on paper. His assets are worth $90 billion. That puts him as the richest man in the world. Now, let me put that in perspective so you get an, understand, you get an understanding of just how rich you're not, okay? <laughs> Bill Gates could give every man, woman, and child in the United States $100,000 apiece, and it still wouldn't deplete his fortune. That's a lot of money. I don't know if you can comprehend $90 billion of anything, but if Bill Gates doesn't get saved and he goes to hell, he's going to comprehend $90 billion, and it'll be in years. It won't be in dollars. Now, Bill Gates is supposed to be the richest man in the world. I'm going to tell you tonight that he's not the richest man in the world. Amen. And what you have in the Lord Jesus Christ is far greater than anything money could ever possibly buy. Amen. When people stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, they're not going to stand there with their pocketbooks and their checkbooks and their cards and all the other things that they use. They're going to stand there naked before Him and He is going to deal with them. And you can meet the Lord Jesus Christ now at Calvary, or you can meet Him there, either way. But the way to meet Him is now, today. Amen. Paul says, behold, now is the accepted time, and now is the time you want to meet Him. Now, Paul spends this time in Ephesians as he writes, turn to chapter 1, and there are six things that we're going to look at in chapter 1. In 12 verses, we're going to look at six things. These six things are absolutely the high points of all the spiritual blessings that you possess in Christ. They're not by any means exhaustive. They are not meant to be. He could not get them in one letter. But I'm going to tell you they are some very wonderful things and so many people today are caught up in the idea of earthly blessings that they fail to understand where their wealth is. And it's not in the bank. It's not in their assets. None of those things are going to last. Have you ever seen a U-Haul behind a hearse? Have you ever seen that? You know, the reason for that is you're not going to take it with you. That's right. When you leave, you're going to leave it all. Paul said you came into this world with nothing and you're going to leave with nothing. And that's the way it is. Now, there's only two things that you come in contact with in this lifetime that are eternal. That is, number one, the soul of men women and children, and two, it's the Word of God. 
And those two things are, are the things that are going to last on into eternity. When you are born into this world, you are your own conscious self forever and ever and ever, and that never changes. But you do have a part in making a decision about where you go, and it is the most important decision that you will ever make. And the Apostle Paul, when he gets to the book of Ephesians, he is going to lay down some truth that will encourage you and, and establish you in the faith so greatly that it will cause you, out of pure love, to be motivated to go out and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Alan Reagan, a good friend of mine who lives in uh, Chattanooga, he calls it, uh, uh, the, it's an attitude of gratitude. And the reason for it is because you now know what you possess in Christ, you have all that you could possibly want. If you have all that you can have in Christ, why do you need anything else? It's hard to figure that out, isn't it? When people are chasing the buck and they're chasing the ring and they're trying to do this and they're trying to do that and they're going to go out and they're going to do this and they're going to do that and they've got big plans. You know, when a guy tells me that he's going to go out and make a bunch of money so he can serve God and do the work of the ministry, I want to find out what he's doing right now. If he's not doing it now, he's not going to do it then. The guy that's faithful and little uh, can be faithful in much. If he's not faithful in little, forget it. It's over. And the idea of faithfulness has to do with you learning some things that you can believe from the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing from the Word of God. It comes by you hearing it, and you can trust the things that Paul says. Now look what he says in chapter 1, verse 3. It's wonderful. It's the most wonderful thing that you'll read, I believe, uh, as a Christian, is to learn about what you have in Christ. These six wonderful blessings. Look at verse 3. Start with me there. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. I don't have some spiritual blessings. I don't have a few. I have them all. Now, the biggest problem with this passage for most people is they've never read it. The second thing is they don't know what a spiritual blessing is. All they know is, you know... I had a flat tire and I had a can of fix a flat. That's a blessing to me. You know, I, I, I was trying to make it through the light and it, and it didn't turn red. That's a blessing to me. You know, I mean, all these things they, they think of as blessings. Paul has a dim view of people that mind earthly things. Did you know that? And he's talking about kingdom oriented things. I have people telling me constantly, you know, the Lord blessed us with this. The Lord blessed us with that. And, you know, we do thank God for all that we have, even the material things. Absolutely. Uh, when we ate tonight at, at the pastor's home, we, we said thank you for the food. When, when, when we sit down, we thank God for the things we have. We know that all things come from God. I mean, folks, Paul makes it clear that he gives, he, he gives us our very breath. It's in him we live and move and have our being. That's why we thank him. But there's only two things that a Christian should pray for. Do you know what they are? You should pray the way Paul prays. And you should pray for empowerment, spiritual understanding, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. You should pray for other saints, right? But there are only two things that you need. And I, I should rephrase that. The two things that you need are the two things that you don't pray for. Let me put it that way. Do you know what they are? Paul says, with food and raiment, therewith be content. And godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay, now think about this for a second. He says, food and raiment, be content. Now, how does he tell you to get your food? What does he tell them? If any man does not work, he shall not eat. In Acts 20, he says that I coveted no man's gold or silver or apparel. How did Paul get his apparel? He bought it. Do you know what you do when you need food? You go buy it and you work for it. Do you know what you need when you need apparel? When you, what you do when you need apparel is you go work for it. Now, you thank God for it when you get it. And you thank God for letting you work for it. But you still work for it. And everything else you don't need. Food and raiment, let us be content. So when you drive that AC car, remember, there's people walking. When you live in that AC house, there's people 
living in tents. There's people living under bridges. Okay? All that you have beyond food and raiment is icing on the cake. Remember that. Because you're going to leave every bit of it. Every bit of it. Eternal things are important. Things that are temporal, see, and things that are eternal. And Paul here is going to share with you some things that are eternal. He's going to share some blessings with you that are so important to you that he spends probably, and I'm going to say that in these 12 verses, you're going to see the longest outflowing of praise in all of his epistles. Here it is, right here. Now notice, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, uh, Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him." in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Wow. How do you deal with that? I can't tell you how many times I've read that passage and how many times I keep looking at it and it's all that I can do to contain myself because I look at that and that's for me. And it's to me. Did you realize, go back to verse 4, that you're part of the elect of God? Do you realize that the Lord Jesus Christ is the only person ever elected by God? Did you know that? And the only way that you ever can participate in the election of God is to be in Christ? People want to have immortality today, don't they? You know, there's only one person that has immortality, according to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Yeah, he dwelleth in the light which no man can approach unto. If you're going to have immortality, you must be in Christ. If you're going to be considered part of God's elect, you must be in the elect. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He hath chosen us. Now, I want you to notice that he hath chosen us. And when you look at that, you say, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. God did not forechoose people to go to heaven. He did not forechoose people to go to hell. He's not willing that any should perish. He's the Savior of all men, especially of them that believe. You go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and it says that it's God's will that all men be saved and come into a knowledge of the truth. But Paul just mentioned this in 1 Thessalonians. He says, knowing therefore, brethren, your election of God. Don't forget it. You're part of the elect. You weren't chosen to go to heaven. You weren't chosen to go to hell. But God has a purpose in choosing you because he chose you in him. Remember that. The choosing takes place in Christ. Now, predestination, the doctrine, begins to teach us a little bit more about how God brings to pass His purpose in election and how He brings it about by predetermining. When I got on the airline this morning, there was a predetermined flight. It was a predetermined number, predetermined, uh, predetermined destination, a predetermined pilot. Everything was predetermined. All I had to do was participate in that. Now, what God predestinated, if you'll notice in verse 5, well, let me read verse 4, that according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, not because we were holy, but to be holy. And he says, and without blame before him in love. I don't know about you, but I love that statement. That makes me feel good when I see that there's a possibility of me being without blame in anything, <laughs> especially before him and because he loved me. But looking at verse 5, he says, having predestinated, notice, us. It's corporate. He says, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself 
according to the good pleasure of his will. By Jesus Christ means that he, by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Holy Spirit and God the Father, predetermined to form an entity called the body of Christ. They formed and made a vehicle. They, they predestinated, listen to me, they predestinated the way. Now, if you're going to participate in getting from point A to point B, you have to participate in the way God says to do it. And he predestinated the way, and the Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the way. And the body of Christ was predestinated. That corporate entity of the body of Christ was predestinated. It's going to go to heaven. It's going to rule and reign. And heaven is not going to be thwarted. God the Father's plan is not going to be thwarted by Satan. It's going to come to pass. And we that are a part of that are predestinated to get there. We're not predestinated to go to heaven because we were chosen capriciously by God and you're chosen and you're not and you're chosen and you're not have you ever met anybody that believed that they don't win souls they don't go out and tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ because there isn't any point in it you're either in or you're out you know the Muslims were teaching that in 650 AD long before John Calvin was ever born it's called the doctrine of dead souls and, and it's a bad doctrine we're not predestinated to salvation. The doctrine of predestination is to teach you and show you that the entity that you're a part of, the body of Christ, is going to heaven no matter what. You're in. You don't have to worry about it. You're running a race. It's a fixed race. It's already been won. But you still have to run it. Because there are souls at stake. And God has set it up this way. He brings to pass His purpose in election by this predestination. He predetermined the way. Look over at Romans chapter 8. Keep your place there in Ephesians and look at Romans chapter 8. For whom He did foreknow, He says. Look at Romans 8, 28. And I like this verse because it gives me some comfort. And when He says in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good. He's not talking about your tire not going flat. He's not talking about your job. He's not talking about your house getting sold, your wife coming back. You know, the, the thing about country music, they say, he went country well ago. You hear him go country? Did you hear Jim go country and singing like a country music singer? I want to look over at Leon and say, look at them boots, Leon. He's got boots on. You know, I enjoy that kind of music, by the way, so that's a compliment. You know what happens if you play a country music backwards? Country music record backwards. Guy gets his dog back. He gets his house back. His wife back. All of that. You know, he's not talking about that. He's talking about, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are, what? The called, according to what? His purpose. Now, when you're standing in your brand new body before the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's a hundred million angels singing in the background, and you're getting ready to launch your new ministry into eternity with all the other members of the body of Christ, you reckon you're going to stand there and say, this worked out pretty good, didn't it? Isn't it going to work out? I mean, Paul's trying to tell you, look, all things work together, what? I mean, is it going to be good when you get there? Okay, so what he's saying is that it's going to come to pass and it will be good. And he's not talking about the details in your daily life because a lot of Christians, they get killed. Down in Texas this past week. Didn't work out good for them. Didn't work out good at Columbine. Didn't work out good at Oklahoma City. Didn't work out for the thousands of people that burned at the stake for this book. Didn't work out for the many, many ladies that died in childbirth, giving birth to people coming across this land. I mean, folks, there's many, many instances where it doesn't work out. Christians do die. They suffer, bleed, and die like everybody else. He's not talking about the details of your life. Matter of fact, it's a safe bet if you're a Christian, the details of your life aren't going to work out like you think they should. I mean, think about it. Life is what happens when you make other plans, right? And as you look at this, you say, well, okay, I know that it's going to work out for good, but look at verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. I like to think of that verse as already conformed to the image of his Son. It just hasn't happened yet. He calleth those things that are not as though they were, Romans 4 says. So I, as far as I'm concerned, it's as good as done. 
It just has to happen. But he says it's going to come to pass to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. Notice the order here, by the way. The order. Predestination, the calling, right? Then justification, and then glorification. Perfect order. That's exactly the way it goes. Folks, we are predestinated in Christ. That's how we have predestination. That's how we understand it. But there's more than that. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. That vehicle is fantastic. Look at verse 11. Ephesians 1.11 says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Calvinists want to tell you that God plans all these things out and so that they happen this way and that way and this way and that way. There are things God does not plan. Did you know that? Now, he knows about them before they ever happen, for whom he did foreknow. They say, well, God's not in control if he doesn't reach it. You know, no, listen to me. You know what God does when these things go awry? You know what he does? He overrules. Have you ever been in a courtroom where they say, overruled, overruled. The judge just keeps overruling the lawyer, overruled. You know what? You know what God does? He superintends his will by overruling and working in the affairs of what? of the lives of his people. And he does that through the doctrine that he puts in his book. When you need something, and you've got a, a need, let's say you have a need. Let's say you have somebody that you have in your family that has a need. And let's say that that need is that they be established in the faith. That they're flipping and flying and going all over the place and won't won't get involved in the work of the ministry, won't be faithful to the work of the ministry. They're not leading people to Christ. They're not doing what they ought to be doing. They're out living for themselves, living unto themselves, as Paul says. When you pray for that person, can you expect results? Yeah. You better expect results because I'm going to tell you something. In the body of Christ, prayer changes things. And God works through the lives of the believers. And it's wonderful to see it. It's fantastic. And that's why prayer, it avails much, even in the dispensation of grace. And I know people are all upset about, well, you can't pray for that. If you can't pray for money, what can you pray for? No. Well, <laughs> hey, pray that this man be established. Pray that this man grows up and begins to learn what it means to be a man of God instead of a baby. You know, there's a lot of babies out there. Mr. O'Hare used to call them ball-headed babies. And the reason for that is that they get later on in life where they begin to lose their hair and go bald and they still don't know any more than the children down in the kindergarten do. Denominationalism is full of those people. Yeah, they're safe, satisfied, and sitting, and every time they look at this book, they go, where'd that come from? I never saw that verse before. Because they're not reading their Bibles. And the reason they're not reading their Bibles is because Satan took it away from them about a hundred years ago and they haven't been seeing it since. It's a problem. I thank God the book that I have in my hand, I consider to be the word of truth right here. I would not deal with people that are lost in the rescue mission, in the prison, in the school system, anywhere that I go, I would not deal with lost people if I thought there was a chance there was a mistake in my Bible. Because with my luck, it'd be the verse that I believed got, that I got saved with that was wrong. Right? Yeah, well, it's true. All things are going to work out, and he's going to bring them to pass, but he's going to do it by overruling. And that's part of predestination, how it works. What about the next one? The third one is redemption. We have obtained freedom through payment of a price. This is not just, uh, you know, God paying the devil some sort of ransom money. That's not what this is. This is... This is freedom from sin and from the tyranny and the slavery of sin. We have redemption. Look at verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins 
according to the riches of His grace. Do you realize that that truth is only spoken three places in Paul's epistles? First time anybody ever asked me that question, I flunked it. I did not know where they were. Romans 3.25 is one. Ephesians 1.7. Colossians 1.14. That's the only three places you're going to find redemption by blood. And I'm going to tell you, it's important that you know that because without the blood, there is no remission of sin. That's why that little square down there is in red, not in green. We want it to be clear. <laughs> what color red do you want on that? Blood red. We want it red. We want it red red because the life of the flesh is in the blood. And if you drain all yours out, you'll die. If you try to offer yours, it, God won't take it. It's no good. However, the Lord Jesus Christ gave His blood and it's through faith in His blood that we have eternal life. And we have redemption through His blood. It was a very costly payment. Amen. Peter calls it the precious blood. Yes. Unto Him, he says in the book of Revelation, he says, unto Him who washed us from our sins in His own blood, he says. He gave His blood for me. Right. Full payment. We're bought and paid for. Uh, Mr. O'Hare uses a uh, illustration I like very much, and I've never forgotten this. Tom and I were talking today about him and his tapes. There was a, a, a man down in New Orleans, and he had bought a young boy in a slave market. And he took the young boy home and cleaned him up and sat him at his table, gave him some new clothes, sat him down at the table, and they were eating. And the man was sitting there discussing with one of his other uh, associates and one of his servants that they were packing up and getting ready to move back to England. They were going to leave. And he noticed that the young slave boy was a little bit upset. He was uh, a little bit disconcerted and looked sad. And uh, he asked the boy, he said, what's the problem, son? And he said, well, he says, my family lives here. All my people live here. And he said, um, I, I don't want to leave them. I don't want to go to England. And he looked at him, he says, I'm, I'm afraid you've misunderstood, son. I bought you today. And since I bought you, I can do anything I choose. And I choose to set you free. You don't have to go to England with me. You know what the boy did? He says, in that case, pack me up, because I'm going to go with you. You know what? Grace motivates you, doesn't it? Grace motivates a person that's been bought and paid for. When you know you're not your own, you're bought with a price, you're redeemed. Now, not only do we have redemption, we also have the forgiveness of sins a wonderful thing, isn't it? Look at the next one. We have Revelation. Look at verse 8. Uh, Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Now today, in the dispensation of grace, we don't literally get revelation from God. That came from God by inspiration to the Apostle Paul. That's where the revelation came. That's where you get the information comes from God to man. However, by reading what Paul wrote by inspiration, we get the revelation ourselves. We call it illumination today. The Holy Spirit himself lives in us. He teaches us the doctrines of this book. We have been made uh, privy to all that God wants us to know. There's nothing left for God to tell you that's not already written down. Have you ever heard the TV preachers, they're trying to tell you something that God told them? God told me to build a hospital. Got to raise a million dollars or I'm going to die. Let's say you've been healing people since 1955 on TV and now you got to build a hospital. Yeah, that makes sense, doesn't it? Got glasses on, you know, fillings in his head, hair's falling out. He needs a hospital. Yeah, he needs more than that. He needs a, he needs a Berean Bible teacher to teach him the Word of God right and divide it, doesn't he? Well, so much for filthy lucre and all the money that's made off the flock. The flock's being fleeced every day. Paul says to the Corinthians, you suffer fools gladly. <laughs> you deserve it, most of them. So the idea is that as you look at this, you get illumination, but you don't get new revelation. Anytime somebody tells you God said to this, to me, you quote him Romans 3, 4. Yea, let God be true and every man a liar. Because you're not getting revelation from God today that way, not direct. You say, well, could you please write that down for me? I'd like to put that in my Bible to make sure I've got a copy of it. If you know your Bible well enough, and a man quotes those sort of things to you, you just find that in the Bible and show it to him. Because whatever he says is already there. Some way, shape, or form. 
But they've got all kinds of ideas on how to control people. And it's uh, pseudo-intellectualism, really, is what it is. They want to speak in a different language. They want to have something you don't have. They want to be the Pope and give it to you a little bit at a time so they can put their thumb down and control you. You don't have to live that way. Under grace, you have the ability to have a book and go in and find from God the things He has for you. It's all free. It's right here. You can buy these for a dollar. You can buy them for nine dollars at Sam's. I know that's where you guys probably get your buy. I see them back there. I buy those things and for nine bucks. See, it's not only inspired, it's not only preserved, it's affordable too. It's everywhere. Anywhere you want to go, you can find the Word of God. We give them out free of charge so people have a Bible. Inheritance is all that God is free to give you because of what He did through Christ. He gives you eternal life. That's pretty good, isn't it? A new glorified body. Can you imagine no sin? Can you comprehend that? It's hard for me to comprehend it. A presence with the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that while we're present in this body, we are absent from the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we look forward to being in His presence someday. Joy unspeakable. Just the thought of it. The position that we're going to have, the power that we're going to have, the authority that we're going to have, the love and everlasting fellowship. And on top of it all, there's going to be rewards too. On top of that, we have an inheritance. Look at Romans chapter 8 once again. We keep going to Romans 8. There's so much over there. Romans and Ephesians are like that, aren't they? They're kind of like the book of Genesis. They're Paul's two books of Genesis, really, because... The beginnings are all there. Look at Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be also glorified together. An heir is not the same as a joint heir. A joint heir has a, has a hook in it. You know what the hook is? The hook is you're going to have to suffer. Joint heir means you're going to reign. There's a difference between living. It's a faithful saying, if we be dead with him, we will live with him. No doubt. He's not going to die himself. He, he can't deny you eternal life. But if you suffer with him and you preach the truth, and you teach it, and you live like you should, and preach the doctrines of grace, and you renounce the hidden things of dishonesty, not handling the Word of God deceitfully, but, but doing and commending yourself before other people in the sight of God, and you live the kind of life that God has made you to live, you know what happens? You're going to suffer. All who live godly in Christ Jesus suffer. All. That's right. And as you begin to suffer, you're going to realize, hey, this is no picnic. Your family, they'll get on your case. <laughs> Start giving it to them. Boy, they don't want to hear it. Your employer, they don't want to hear it. Even the people in your congregation, they don't want to hear it. We have an advantage there because we have a rule. It's like Brother Clyde said, you know, you come and you listen as long as you want and you can leave. We're going to come and preach as long as we want and we're going to leave. See, the idea is that people need to understand that suffering is a part of the Christian life. See, we're not delivered from suffering. We're delivered through suffering. There's a difference. It's His suffering. And through that suffering, we understand that there's going to be problems. But I'm going to tell you, there's a bigger payoff for you in the end. Eternal glory is a fantastic thing. When, it, when General Colin Powell walks up to the podium... You know, they have him come in, and he's got all the decorations on, he's got the outfit on, you know. Is there any doubt what this gentleman is? Does everybody know what he is? I mean, when Patton wears those stars across his helmet, is there any doubt about what he is? In eternity, do you think there'll be any doubt about what you did and what you taught and what you preached? Believe me, they're not going to have to ask you, were you a grace believer when you were down there? <laughs> You're going to be known because you're going to be put in a position of power and rank and authority. 
And it's going to be because you suffered. Even the kingdom program uses that concept. When you're faithful, you get put over how many cities? How many cities? How many cities? Over and over. See? The, the apostles suffered much, didn't they? They got 12 thrones out of it. They argued over who was going to sit where, but <laughs> still, <laughs> didn't make any difference. They got it. Look at verse 13. Turn back there if you would. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 13. Some of this is going to have to flow into tomorrow night because I know you folks are going to... It's going to take too long to get through all this tonight, but some of this we'll put into tomorrow night. But I want to show you these six things and uh, we'll see if we can't get through a little bit of the next part of the last... Finish chapter 1 tonight. The idea here in the sixth one, uh, the, the last one, is that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Look at this. This is wonderful. Look at verse 13. In whom we have trusted, in whom you also trusted. After that, you heard the word of truth, the gospel. Notice how Paul makes it personal. What does he call it? The gospel of your salvation. I love that. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with what? Yeah, you're sealed with that Holy Spirit. When you put money down on a house, do you intend to come back? My wife and I put money down on a house one time and we fully intended to get the rest of it. We didn't throw that money away. When you put money down on a house, you're going to come back, aren't you? Most of the time, anyway. Well, let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit is the down payment by God that He's going to give you the rest. The seal is the seal of ownership. And it is a seal that everybody is fully aware of. It's also a seal of security that you're safe in Christ. Would it be possible, do you think, for part of the body of Christ to not make it to heaven and go to hell. Do you think there'll be part up there and part down there? Do you think there's anybody that you could ever once in your life call a brother that goes to hell? No brother of mine's ever going to go to hell. So you think about that for a second. And you say, well, I'm sealed. The Holy Spirit himself is the seal. He is the seal of ownership. He is the seal of security. We're God's own. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'll show you a couple passages here that I really enjoy reading. He says in verse 19, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Paul says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Notice this. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are whose? God's. I'll show you one that I like a lot. This is a lot of fun. Look at Acts chapter 27. I like this one because I found it by myself. I don't find much by myself, but <laughs> I try to use all the help I can get. But This one I thought was so interesting. Look at um, Acts chapter 27. And um, verse 22. This is just a little phrase. It's not, it's not any great uh, doctrinal treatise on the subject. But it's, it's giving you an idea how the apostle thought. And I like that. Verse 22. 27, 22. And now he says, I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, notice the next three words, whose I am. Who did Paul know he belonged to? Yeah. He says, and whom I serve. You know he's talking about God there because he wouldn't say, and whom I serve. You know whose he was? He was God's. He was God's man. And you are too. There's ownership. See, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. See, the war's over. There is no more enmity because we're justified by faith. Chapter 5 of Romans is a great chapter to read if you doubt whether you're keeping your salvation or not. People don't lose salvation. Don't have it. Or they got it and just don't know it. 
That's it. They're insecure. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit's ministry is reaching. It's far-reaching because He comforts and guides us, doesn't He? He teaches us, doesn't He? He admonishes us. He reproves us. He rebukes us. He convinces us. He convicts us. He baptizes us into the body of Christ. He encourages us. He intercedes for us. And man, He loves us. People don't think of the Holy Spirit sometimes. I don't think they give Him the, the prominence that He deserves. And I know that when the Spirit speaks, He never speaks of Himself, does He? He always exalts the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know, in the dispensation of grace, it's the Holy Spirit Himself that indwells us so that God the Father can indwell us and so that God the Son can indwell us. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Do you realize how this happens? I always wondered, how does God the Father live in me? I thought He was up there. How does God the Son live in me? I thought He was up there. Well, He's omnipresent, for one thing. <laughs> and He's omniscient. And he's, and he's omnipotent. But there's a way that He designs this to happen. And all across this globe tonight, folks, there are millions and millions and millions of people that are in the body of Christ, and they all have the Holy Spirit in and notice what he says in verse 21 of chapter 2. He says, In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together, notice, for an habitation of God, how? Through the Spirit. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. And all of this in just 12 verses of the first chapter. There's a lot more in your spiritual blessings. You have a lot in Christ. Now, I want to share with you just a few more things, and then we'll stop. Just a few more. Uh, I want to talk to you about the rest of chapter 1. Now, the first section of this is where Paul gives praise for our spiritual blessings in Christ. Okay? In chapter 1, verse 15 now, notice in 15, all the way down through 22 or 23, he is going to pray... For spiritual perception that we understand. This is where I was talking about a while ago about what you should pray for. Over in Romans, he says, we, we know not what to pray for as we ought. But by the time you get to Ephesians, you're learning how to pray. You're beginning to understand, see? And you begin to focus your pray, and you when you pray, you pray with the understanding. You pray with some things in your heart that teach you that, well, I don't have to pray. I don't have to pray for that anymore. It's not necessary. Would you ever pray for somebody to be saved? I, you know, I think about that. People say, well, pray that they'll get saved. I don't pray for anybody to get saved. It wouldn't do any good. You don't pray for people to get saved. People have to believe the gospel to get saved. If I thought I could pray them into heaven, I'd be praying 24 hours a day. You don't pray for people to get saved. But when people are going out to talk to people that they want to get saved, I pray for them. That they would be bold. That they would have clearness of thought. That they would take time in preparing themselves. That they would use courtesy and love when they give the God. I mean, multiplicity of things you can pray for those individuals that are going out. But the Lord Jesus Christ never prayed for lost people. Paul never once prays for lost people. Lost people's problems aren't solved by you praying. I teach uh, our people down there, even our little ones, about the sinner's prayer. And I focus on that idea. Uh, our motto there at Suncoast Bible Fellowship is if you lead them to Christ, you lead them in prayer. Don't you dare have somebody repeat a prayer while, after you lead them to Christ. You know why we don't do that? Take one guess. Praying, praying is a work. Did you know that? It's a good work. It's a great work. Epaphras, he labored fervently in prayer. Now, when you pray, it's a good work. When you let your request be made known unto God, you are asking God for something, aren't you? That's prayer. So don't tell people, ask Jesus into your heart. It's a work. It's a request. It's a prayer. 
Don't put a work anywhere in the vicinity of faith. Abraham will teach you that. It's a simple, simple program back there. You can understand that. When you lead somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ, you can certainly pray with them. Lead them in prayer. Let them watch you pray. Teach them to pray. But don't let them sit there and mumble through a prayer and somewhere, somehow, they think, that's what did it. You know, people think that way, don't they? The prayer that Paul prays here is one of the greatest prayers you will ever read about in the Scriptures. Look at verse 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Notice what he says, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. The next time a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door knocking, you show them that verse. They start giving you trouble about the word Jehovah in your Bible. Say, I've got a name that's above every name. Here it is, right here. Not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Woo. Three things there in the last part of chapter one. He wants you to know what is the hope of your calling. The blessed, the glorious, blessed hope. He wants you to know what is your inheritance is. What your inheritance is. This wonderful inheritance, uh, and he wants you to know about God's inheritance, and he wants you to know about the power that you have. Now, the hope of your calling. What is a calling, by the way? When you think of a calling, what do you think of? They always talk about the preacher. Did you get the call? Did you get the call? You know what the call is, don't you? The calling is your response. When God calls, you say yes or no. That's right. The calling. Paul said he called me by his grace. What was the first thing Jesus Christ said to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus? Saul, Saul. What was he doing? He's calling him. He, said this, he did the same thing to Samuel. Samuel, he'd get up, here am I. I said, go back to sleep. He's not calling you. He'd go back in there, lay down. Samuel, here am I. <laughs> you remember that? Saul didn't have to worry. About, he didn't do that, did he? Saul came to a realization on the road to Damascus. His calling was right there. He was chasing down people that believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the Lord Jesus Christ said, Saul, Saul, he was calling him. See, and, he, and he, he said, who art thou? He's looking around. Is that you, Lord? Is that you? He says, he finishes the sentence. He doesn't say, I am, like he does all through the book of John. He says, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Right. He makes real clear who he is. Right. It's specific. Saul is working for God in his own mind until he meets him. And then he realizes the person he's persecuting is God. Whoops. Hello. Is that you, Lord? Is that you? He knew God spoke from heaven. He wasn't stupid. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. The problem was that the God that was speaking from heaven was Jesus Christ. What will thou have me to do? He answered the call, didn't he? Yeah. We have a holy calling. See? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul says in verse 8, uh, 2 Timothy 1 8, he says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our, of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the affliction.
gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with an holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Man, that's great. The hope of your calling. You know, without Christ, there is no hope. Christ in you is the hope of glory. That's all there is to it. I mean, if you don't have Christ, you've got no hope. And he says, the hope of your calling, you know what it is, it's, it's, it's resurrection. Yeah, it's translation. It's being caught up. It's being delivered. He says, and he will yet deliver us. There's a final transformation, and it's going to happen. may happen tonight. may happen tomorrow night. It's going to happen. And he wants you to know about that hope. He doesn't say, study the blessed hope once a year. No. He wants you to look for that blessed hope. In Titus 2, he says, looking. What does that imply? Looking means what? Constantly looking. Otis uh, Wasson, the man that uh, Tom was referring to being a teacher of mine early on when I was first coming into the message and understanding grace truth, he used to go to a uh, sanitarium. And there was a lady there in the sanitarium who would sit on the bench out there on the walkway in the garden. And she'd sit there and she'd sit down like this and she had her Bible and she'd sit with her head bowed and she's kind of reading. And every time a person would walk by, she'd look up and she'd say, he's coming back. That's all she would say. He's coming back. And after many years of going out to that sanitarium and seeing that same lady sitting there, and he'd look over there, and every time somebody walked by, he's coming back. That's all she would say. Otis began to think, she's not so crazy after all. <laughs> she's preaching grace truth. You know, besides all of that, God has an inheritance also. You know, he has an inheritance in Israel. You can see where Solomon mentions it back when he dedicates the temple back there. You can see that God's inheritance in the earth is the nation of Israel. But when you look at that verse back in Ephesians 1, he says that he wants you to know what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. What in the world would God need an inheritance for? I always wrestle with this passage and I thought, what is in the world? What is he talking about? But you know, it's quite simple, really. It's not that difficult to get. You are going to inherit everything in Christ. And I'm going to tell you tonight, it's not like when you go to the lawyers after uh, the will is drawn up and, and the, the, parent, the last parent is dead and they're going to divvy it up between the fighting children. That's not how it is. You're not going to get a slice and he's going to get a slice and she's going to get a slice and she's going to get a slice. That's not how it is. We all get the whole pie, everything in Christ. We inherit it all. Paul doesn't just say uh, that he's going to do it. He says, how shall he not freely with him give us all things? We've got it all coming in Christ. Now, the question I want to show you here in this is that, that Jesus Christ has an inheritance in us. You know, back in Genesis, when he does the creation account, he says, I love this at the end, he says, and he made the stars also. We take the kids out to the, the uh, platform out at the campgrounds and we take them up, climb this tower and we all lay up there on our back and we look at the stars at night out in the woods and do all the, watch the constellations. They love doing that. Get the telescopes out and everything. And we marvel at those stars. And you can analyze a star. You can get a chunk of it. You can look at it. You can, you can uh, you know, watch them. You can track them. You can be totally mystified by them. You can even run your life by them. Of course, we don't, but people on TV do, don't they? You know what? A star cannot love anybody back. A star cannot adore God. A star cannot, he cannot fellowship with a star. He cannot do that with inanimate things. He is going to inherit millions and millions and millions of sons. Not just one son now, but millions of sons. And all of those sons are going to spend eternity adoring Him, loving Him, fellowshipping with Him, worshipping Him. 
excited about just being in His presence, and they'll all be there because they believed His Word and made a conscious decision of their own will to be there. Now, how would you like to be surrounded with those kind of people in eternity? Do you think God wants that? He made a plan before the foundation of the world to bring it to pass. You and I are part of it. We are His inheritance. It's a wonderful thing. And it's going to be fun. I can't wait. Can you? Now the last one, and we'll close with this one. That He wants us to know what His power toward us word who believe is. The big thing today is power, isn't it? I was joking with Leon about his power tie back there. They were giving him a hard time about his neon tie. But you know, people today, it's, everything's power. I mean, it's all about power. It's not, I mean, it's not like we were talking about Bill Gates a while ago. It isn't about money with him anymore. It's about what? It's about power. Politicians, it's about power. It's all about power. It's all about tyranny over other people. That's what it's about. It's all about who we can enslave and suck it all out of them. That's what it's all about. It's power. Always has been, always will be when it comes to the will of man. But the power that we have is far greater than any possible thing that you could ever gain down here. We have the power of His resurrection. You want to tap some power? How, how powerful do you think His resurrection was? I think about that sometimes. How powerful is that? Well, it's the most powerful demonstration that's ever been displayed in the history of the universe was when God was raised from the dead by His Father. When God was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit and when the Lord Jesus Christ as God raised Himself Amen. from the dead. Amen. Yeah, there it is. That's power. Right. He went to hell, paid the price, and then brought Himself back. Now, does that pretty much conquer everything? That's it. You can put your trust in that power. You know, when he went out in the wilderness to, to fight the devil, 40 days, people think he went out there to be tested to see if he was going to cut the mustard or not. They built a big, tall, huge bridge, a railroad trestle across a chasm out in Colorado. And they spanned one of the greatest expanses of rock that had ever been, it was huge. They built this thing, and it was down, there was a big gorge underneath it. And they brought a big locomotive out there, had a bunch of cars on it, filled them up full of coal, and they were going to take it out there to see if it was going to hold it. People wondering whether that thing was going to fall in or not. The people that engineered that bridge got on that thing, and they roared out there, slammed on the brakes, and pulled a horn, you know, pulled a whistle there, and they blew it. You know what they were doing? They weren't going to see if it was going to hold. They were going to prove that it was going to hold. The Lord Jesus Christ was not tested to see if he was going to cut the mustard. He was tested by God to demonstrate that you could put your faith and trust in him. When it comes to Satan, he vanquished him. He vanquished him there, and he vanquished him at the cross of Calvary. You don't have to worry about it. The power that we have is available to you. Now, let me show you where it is. Look at 1 Thessalonians. Before you can learn about the resurrection, you've got to read about it. This is the very first thing that you'll see if you walk in my home. I have this painted on a, on a uh, piece of cherry. It's, a, it's a, Actually, what it is, it's a cherry uh, kitchen cabinet door. And uh, a lady hand painted this in Old English script, this verse right here. And when you walk in, this is what you see. It's one of my favorite verses. It says, verse 13, 1 Thessalonians 2.13... Paul says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The power that you have comes right from this book. Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. If you want to get power in your life, if you want to understand how to fight the good fight, if you want to understand the, cry, the battle cry, if you want to be able to go out there with some serious power, take a King James Bible, learn it, and go talk to people with it. And you know what will happen? To the world.